Romans chapter 9 this morning. Our text 13 through 16. So if you don't mind standing with me as we read from God's Word. Start in verse 10, just for the sake of context. Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 10. Not only that, but Rebekah's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born, or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then, sh what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. And Lord, again, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds as we study. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, quick recap. It's been a couple weeks since we've studied together in Romans, so a little recap of our last couple studies. So, we saw in chapter 8, God works all things together for the good, for those who love him, those who are followers of his. And it's for the purpose of those lovers of Jesus being conformed to the likeness of who? Jesus. That's God's big purpose for, for all of our lives as believers. I believe for all people, but specifically the context in Romans chapter 8 is for believers. So that purpose of God is mentioned again in chapter 9, and we've studied this already. So it's important to keep in mind, Paul uses the word purpose back in chapter 8. The big purpose for our lives, from God's perspective, is to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. That purpose doesn't change when it comes up again in chapter 9. Same context, so, so keep that in mind. It's important to understand as we talk about things like God's calling, His election, predestination, all words that we've looked at, things that we've studied as we've been going through Romans. But again, context. Can't forget the context. Okay? So back to Romans chapter 8, if, you've, if your Bible's open and you can see that. We looked in verses 28 and 29 about those that God has purposed to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. It mentions those He foreknew he predestined. Those he foreknew, he those he foreknew, he predestined. So all of what comes after that, including the text that we're in today, and, and really Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, all of that has to be filtered through what we've already read. A person's predestined predestined according to the foreknowledge of God. God sees the beginning from the end. That, that's hard for us to comprehend, right? It's not hard for God to comprehend. He sits outside of time. So we've got to understand that as we continue through in our text today. So those who respond to his offer of salvation, those who respond to the Spirit's work of conviction, we talked about this a couple weeks ago in John chapter 16. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes into the world, he will convict the world in regards to sin. And it says world. I believe the Spirit of God convicts all mankind. Do all people respond to the Spirit's conviction? No, of course not. So <clears throat> those who accept his free gift of life, salvation, those who respond to the work of his Spirit, bringing conviction into their lives, those are who God calls his elect or his chosen. So Paul, in in our study in the last couple weeks, Paul has given us a few examples from the Old Testament to illustrate what he's talking about. He's spoken of God's purpose in election in verse 11 as it related to a couple, well, one family, but a couple individuals specifically. And so we, we looked back at those, we unpacked those stories. God's purpose for Isaac, his purpose for Jacob, was that they would be conformed to his image. Now, those two guys had brothers, didn't they? Isaac had a, bro a brother named Ishmael. Jacob had a brother named... And when you dig into their stories, you understand that, that they rejected 
the things of God. You look at both of their lives, and I encourage you to do this if you haven't. God blessed both of them. And they were both the father of nations, of a, a nation that came from those two individuals. Many descendants. So God blessed them, but yet they still didn't want to have anything to do with spiritual things. And we've got to understand that to understand the big picture of what Paul is saying. We've got to go back into the story to understand these things. So in Isaac's case, as we looked at his story, God's calling in Isaac's life was contrary to what made sense. It was contrary to what was practical. Because Isaac already had a brother. Isaac wasn't born yet, but there was already a son born to, to Abraham, right? Ishmael. And Ishmael was the work of the spirit or the work of the flesh? The flesh. Abraham and his bride decided that they were going to help God out. And so Sarah, as you guys know, she was getting old and older and older and older. And the promise still hadn't come that she would bear a son. And so God kept coming back to Abraham and reminding him of the promise. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But Lord, I've already got this son, Ishmael. Just let your promise and your blessing come through him. God said, no, it's going to come from my promise. It's going to come from your bride, Sarah's womb. And so that promise was contrary to what Abraham and Sarah thought should happen or what they wanted to happen. But when God promises, folks, does he, does he come through? Always. In the case of Jacob, it didn't make any sense for God to call him because he was the younger son. His older brother Esau was born first. And the older son was always the one to receive the blessing. Always the one to receive the double inheritance. But God did things a little differently, didn't he? So we understand and we, we see as we study his life, the life of Jacob, that it didn't really make any sense for God to call him. But God knew in advance what was going to happen. His foreknowledge allowed him to see how things were going to play out in the lives of these two brothers. He knew that Esau wasn't going to want to walk with him and wasn't going to care about spiritual things. And Jacob, complete opposite. He cared about the things of God. So before they were even born, as we looked at in our last study, <clears throat> before they had done anything good or bad, God declared to Rebekah that the older would serve the younger. God knew what was coming. So by declaring that the older would serve the younger, and then seeing how things played out in their lives, and then in generations to come, it demonstrated to us God's wisdom and God's foreknowledge. Not just in the lives of those guys as they lived on the earth, but in generations to come, as we're going to see in verse 13. So I know that's a long introduction. It's important to understand that before we dive into to verse 13 because verse 13 is one of the most butchered verses in all of the Bible. Just as it is written, verse 13, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So as with many passages of Scripture, and I hammer on this all the time. I know, we get so sick of you talking about context. So many passages in Scripture get butchered because people will take them and they'll pull them out and they'll assign their own meaning to them without understanding the context of that passage. You have to understand the context of the entire book of Romans in order to understand what Paul's talking about here. So, entire movements, folks. Entire movements, and I won't say the name because when I say the name I get people really fired up and excited and riled up. So I want to make you work a little bit harder to get riled up and excited. There are entire movements that are influenced by wrong interpretations of Romans 9, 10, and 11, and specifically verse 13. People get really excited about this stuff. For some, they have this idea, in my opinion, an unbiblical idea that God loves some individuals, the elect, and he doesn't love those who are the non-elect. I believe that's unbiblical. I, I believe it just doesn't line up with Scripture. So God, he chooses, he elects in these people's estimation, in these folks' theology. He chooses and he elects some to receive salvation. 
And for really no rhyme or reason other than that it's his sovereign will, he chooses others to be the object of his wrath and his scorn and in eternity in hell separated from him. To be the, fi- the fuel for the fires of hell. And so to me, you guys know this if you've been around for any amount of time, this is a hot button for me. Because any theology that we buy into, any doctrine that we buy into, that paints a different picture of the nature and character of God than what the scriptures as a whole teach, that's a big deal. And I believe these doctrines that I'm talking about, they do just that. So, I've been hammering away. Context, 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 context. What's Paul talking about in verse 13 here? How do we know what he's talking about? The first clue he gives us so that we can understand what he means is the phrase, it is written. When we see it is written, that means we have to go back to what is written. Right? You guys are still with me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> it, it, it's somewhat shocking to me when, when I run across uh, interpretations Uh, of this verse from folks that that think that God loved Jacob the man and hated Esau the man. Because that's not what it's saying. In fact, many folks would be surprised by this. God never made this statement to Rebekah. God never made this statement in verse 13 to Jacob or Esau. This statement was made, folks, 1,500 years after Jacob and Esau were dead and gone. He's quoting from the book of Malachi. And if you're a history buff, you can do the math. It's a long time after. So Malachi chapter 1, if you flip there, it's the last book of your Old Testament. So should be easy to find-ish. If you find Matthew, just keep going to your left and you'll find Malachi. So Malachi chapter 1, I want to read this to you. This is what Paul quotes. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Malachi verse, or chapter 1, verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau's brother, or was not Esau Jacob's brother, the Lord says. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated, and have turned his mountains into a wasteland, and his inheritance to the desert jackals. 1,500 years after Jacob and Esau were dead and gone. So, Paul's statement in verse 13 of Romans chapter 9. God is not saying, I hated the man, Jacob. Or, excuse me, I hated, I loved the man, Jacob. I hated the man, Esau. That's not what it's saying. It's talking about the descendants of both of these men. The group of descendants, the nation, if you would, that came from both of these men. Still with me? Okay, one or two of you are still with me. You say, well, Trav, how's it different to hate a group or to hate a man? How's that that not the same thing? So for those of you that that know me, you know that I'm a Bobcat fan. I've been raised here most of my life, so I've been a Bobcat fan since I was a little guy. went to school there and graduated there. So those of you who uh, get the privilege of um, experiencing more of my fleshly nature... Um, you know that it's not uncommon for me to say, oh, I hate those Grizzlies. I just hate those. I just hate that team. Ah! Sorry, Grizzly fans, if you're in here today. A few years ago, I had a, a younger cousin, a much younger cousin, that, that played in, in uh, one of the high schools in Missoula and signed with the Grizzlies to play football. He's a little Grizzly fan since the time he was a little guy. And so, you know, great kid, great football player, just made a terrible choice of where to go play football. (laughs) But um, he was on the Grizzly football team for a couple of years, and I still hated the Grizzlies. Did that mean that I hated him as an individual? No. I could say, I I hate the Grizzlies. I hate their colors. I hate what they stand for. But he's my cousin, and I would love him regardless of what team he played for. So, to me, it made sense that I could hate the team, could hate the group, but love the individual. 
Corrie Ten Boom, many of you guys know the story. She was held captive by the Nazis and saw unspeakable things. Unbelievable things. Many of them were done to her and to friends of hers, fellow Jews, family members. And, of course, a strong believer. And you read about her, her story, her testimony. She's just got a, an infectious love for God. Like any believer who looked at the Nazis as a whole, what they stood for and the things that they did, easy for a believer to say, I hate what they stand for. I hate the things that they do. I hate that group and, and, and all that they represent. But individually, she had Nazi captors that mistreated her horribly, and yet she had a great love for those people. And God used her in the lives of many people. So, again, as we step back from this, what, what is being said in this passage Jacob I have loved, the group, the descendants of Jacob I have loved, the descendants of Esau I have hated. I've hated what they've stood for. I've hated the things that they've done. Doesn't mean, though, that God hated the man Esau. Big difference, in my opinion. So why does it say that God hated the nation or the descendants of Esau? What, what's it talking about? If you are a history person, if you've studied these things out, you know that, that the descendants of Esau, usually called the Edomites, had a long and sad and tragic history of persecuting God's people over and over and over and over again. Constantly. We'll look at a few of those this morning. Just a, a couple examples, and there are bunches of them. But if you flip to Numbers, Numbers chapter 20, I'm going to read one of the first examples of this in Scripture. So the, the Israelites were led supernaturally by God out of, out of Egypt. And they wandered around for a while and, and were moving towards the promised land. So Numbers chapter 20, we, we see a, just a, a small clip here in their history of, of their period of time wandering. So in Numbers chapter 20, look at verse 14. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Edom's another name for Esau, correct. This is what your brother Israel says. You know about all the hardships that, that have come upon us. Our forefathers went down into Egypt and we lived there many years. The Egyptians mistreated us and our fathers, but when we cried out to the Lord, he heard our cry and sent an angel and brought us up out of Egypt. Now we are here at Kadesh, a town on the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your country. We will not go through any field or vineyard or drink water from any well. We'll travel along the king's highway and not turn to the right or to the left until we have passed through your territory. Hmm. Pretty simple request. Not that big of a deal, right? But Edom answered, you may not pass through here, and if you try, we will march out and attack you with the sword. The Israelites replied, we'll go along the main road. And if our livestock drink any of your water, we'll pay for it. We only want to pass through on foot, nothing else. And again, they answered, you may not pass through. And then Edom came out against them with a large and powerful army. Since Edom refused to let them go through their territory, Israel turned away from them. Who led the Israelites out of Egypt? I mean, Moses the man did, but... But big picture, who led them out? God did. And everybody knew it in that area. Everybody knew how God had supernaturally, miraculously laid waste to the most powerful military on the planet at that time, the Egyptian army. And so these Edomites, no question, knew about that. They knew who the God of the Israelites were, the God of Jacob. And yet they said, forget you guys, you're not going to pass through on our land. Those of you studying with us on Wednesday night, the book of Esther, we haven't yet gotten to this in the story, but those of you who know the story of Esther, you know of a guy named Haman. Haman had a plan to wipe out all the Jewish people in, in the, the Persian kingdom. You know who Haman was a descendant of? Esau. Amazing. In 586, again, those of you who've been studying with us on Wednesday night, you know the history. Nebuchadnezzar in 586 laid waste to Jerusalem, just wiped Jerusalem out. Took a number of, 
uh, obviously, lots and lots of captives back to, to Babylon. But when he attacked Jerusalem and destroyed it, you'll never guess which group of people helped him do it. Butchering babies and little kids and, and just reveled in his great victory there. You'll never guess who. The descendants of Esau. We, last week, we read about King Herod, the story of Jesus. Remember when King Herod found out that a king was going to be born? Remember what he did to prevent anyone from overtaking his kingdom? What did he do? Had all those little babies in the area of Bethlehem butchered, didn't he? You know who King Herod is a descendant of? Yeah, Esau. So because of acts like that, and many, many others, too numerous to mention here, didn't these descendants of Esau deserve to be hated by God because of what they did? It's a tough question. And I think sometimes our perspective is, is a little bit askew. They didn't have to treat the Israelites the way that they did over and over and over and over again. They knew better than to do that. And yet they still did. Did God know in advance how the descendants of Edom were going to treat his people? Of course he did. And so, again, God's choice of choosing Jacob, God understood. He knew his foreknowledge, his sovereignty, his wisdom. He knew that not only would Esau reject him over and over and over through his life, but his descendants would continue to do it. He was literally the father of a nation who followed in his footsteps in their rejection of God over and over and over. Still with me? Okay. Verse 14, 14 and 15. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? That's not fair, God. Paul says, not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on who I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So Paul, of course, knew the objections and the arguments that people would come up with in their minds as he was writing this out. And so he preemptively addresses those things in, in verses 14 and 15. Doesn't matter, folks, what God does or how he does it, there will always be people who think they know better than God. <laughs> not us, of course, but other people will think that they know better than God. And God, you just didn't do it right. This isn't fair. How could you? And on and on and on. So Paul understands this about human nature. So he quotes here, interestingly, from the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verse 19. And in this passage, God is speaking to Moses. He says, I will have mercy on who I will have mercy. I will have compassion on who I will have compassion. So face value, what he's talking about here, because God is God, he can do whatever he wants. To whoever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, because he is God. So that's face value. God doesn't have to show mercy to anyone because none of us deserve it. God doesn't have to show love and grace to anyone because none of us deserve it. If there's anything in the Bible, and, and again, back to this idea that, you know, is God just unjust? Is God unfair? If there's anything unfair or unjust in the Bible, it's this that the perfect son of God was butchered and tortured and crucified in your place and in my place. If there's anything in the Bible that's unfair, it's that. None of us deserved what we got from him. We deserved hell. He gave us his only son. So don't lose the big picture here, folks. God is God and he can do whatever he wants. The fact that he's chosen to show mercy to anybody is unbelievable. Wow, Lord, thank you that you would show us mercy and grace. So our perspective, in my opinion, is sometimes just off base. Was it wrong for God to show love to the descendants of Jacob 
and to say that he hated the descendants of Esau. Is that wrong? Is that unjust? Is that unfair? No way. None of us, including the descendants of Jacob, the Israelites, none of us deserve God's mercy and grace. So what's really interesting here is where he pulls from in order to, to make this point, that he pulls from the book of Exodus. And uh, it's, it's a fun story. You guys, many of you are familiar with it. So in chapter 33, verse 19, God makes this statement that Paul quotes here in Romans chapter 9. He makes this statement to Moses. But it's on the heels of chapter 32, of course, because 33 comes after 32 for those of you that are still awake. What happened in Exodus 32? Exodus 32, Moses went up on Mount Sinai to get what from God? The Ten Commandments. Was that a pretty big deal for the descendants of Jacob, the Israelites, the Ten Commandments? Folks, everything revolved around the Ten Commandments for them. The, the law of God was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. So Moses is up on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments. Anyone remember how long he was up there? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's more than a few days, but it's not years, right? And the Israelites down below, where is Moses at? I'm so sick of waiting for him. So they go to a guy named Aaron, Moses' brother, the very first high priest. We're tired of waiting for Moses. Just make some gods for us so we can worship some gods because we're just tired of waiting for Moses. So great spiritual man of God that Aaron was, he said, okay, well, just bring me all your jewelry. So he melted all their jewelry, all their gold, and it says he formed and fashioned an idol in the form of a calf and said, here, Israel, is your God that led you out of Egypt. And the people begin to, to worship. And, and if you dig into the original language, it implies that it was a, a wild, crazy bunch of worshiping that was going on. Many would say involving uh, sexual stuff. Just insane what they were involved in there. And so God, of course, up on Mount Sinai with Moses, he knew what was going on down below. Oh, Moses you got to get back down there. These people, they're stiff-necked, they're rebellious. you you got to go down there. And man, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, we'll read the passage in a minute. I'm just going to wipe these people out. I'm sick of them. I'm tired of their stiff-necked rebellion. So that's the context, folks, of what we see here in chapter 33, verse 19, that Paul quotes in Romans chapter 9. That's the context. Let me read to you. If you flip back to Exodus, I know I probably butchered that really, really badly, but I want to read a few verses from chapter 32. Look at verse 7. Exodus 32, verse 7. Look at what God says to Moses. So this is while the Israelites are down below worshiping and going crazy around this calf that Aaron had made. Then the Lord said, verse 7 to Moses, Go down, because your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they're a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Folks, these are the descendants of who? Jacob, right? The descendants of Israel right here. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Oh, Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought up out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn your fierce anger away and relent and do not bring disaster upon your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. What's Moses doing here? Reminding God of his promise. Interesting. 
Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land. I promise to them. And it will be their inheritance forever. And then the Lord relented and did not bring on, this, on his people the disaster he had threatened. Now, this passage that I just read, is this just a demonstration of how God's just got a short fuse and he's just, he's just waiting to just fly off the handle and bang, just smash us into, into, into a million pieces, right? Is that, is that what this demonstrates? Is it meant to show us, oh man, this Moses guy, he was so amazing. I mean, God was just a jerk and he just wanted to wipe him out. But Moses, oh, what an amazing man of God Moses is. Or is that whole interaction to show us that God is teaching his son, Moses, what it's like to have his heart as he leads his people? Remember what Paul said in the beginning of Romans chapter 9? about his people, the descendants of Israel. Oh, I wish that I was cut off from God so that my countrymen would understand and know all that God has done for them. It's the same heart that Moses had that we see in the Apostle Paul. So, <clears throat> context, in my opinion, is, is hugely important here. It's impossible if you're digging into what Paul is saying to, to not make the connection between Paul's heart at the beginning of Romans 9 and the heart that we see in Moses that God created in him back in the story of Exodus. Still with me? Okay. So to me, the great irony of, of this passage in Romans that we're, we're looking at is it's used by, by some people in the body of Christ to ex explain their doctrines of, I'll just, I'll just say, exclusion. They come up with these doctrines of exclusion. God only wants these people and, and this specific group and he doesn't care about, doesn't love. He's just created this group for the fires of hell. And so they have these doctrines of exclusion. God has chosen, elected some for the opportunity to be saved and for others, they don't even have a chance at that. God has created them. It's impossible for them to even have an opportunity to respond to salvation. So the irony here is that they use passages like this to support that idea when, to me, the passage says the exact opposite. It's, we see an inclusive God here who looks at his chosen people who are doing unbelievably rebellious things. I mean, that story in, in Exodus 32, folks, in my opinion, is second only to the Jews' rejection of Jesus, it's the most unbelievable slap in the face, rebellion to God in all of the Bible. And yet God responds to Moses, Paul quotes it here in, in verse 9, I will show mercy to who I will have mercy, and I will show compassion to who I will have compassion. He showed them mercy, and they didn't deserve it. Got some big eyes out there. Got some sleepy eyes too. <laughs> verse 16, it does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. God's election, his choosing of anyone has nothing to do with man's desire or effort. It's based solely on the mercy of God. God can show mercy to whoever he wants because he's God. He can withhold mercy from anyone he wants because he's God. And this is where I diverge with, with some of those folks who have these other doctrines that they buy into that essentially say that God doesn't love all people and only loves and only makes salvation available for the elect. This is where I diverge from them. Because I believe the scriptures are clear that God extends mercy to all people. God has made mercy available to all mankind. Not all mankind responds to his mercy. I don't know, Pastor Trev. I think you're blowing smoke. Flip to Psalm 145, and many of you know this and probably have this one memorized, so it's nothing new for you, but Psalm 145. Look at verse 9. 
Psalm 145, verse 9. Let me start in verse 8, though, for the sake of context. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love, but only for the elect. It doesn't say that. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that He has made. The, the translation in some of your Bibles is mercy, and that's a correct translation for compassion. He has mercy on all that He has made. Now what's interesting about that, when you dig into the Hebrew, the original language there, the word for mercy in Exodus 33, 19 which Paul quotes in Romans chapter 9, right? The word for mercy there is the same word that's used in Psalm 145 verse 9 for compassion or mercy in your translation. Same exact word. So Paul knew this. He knew for those that are willing to dig in and to go back to the original language and to find out what I'm really saying, they're going to make this connection from Romans chapter 9, Exodus 33, 19, Psalm 145, verse 9. God has compassion. He has mercy on all that he has made. But not all people receive his mercy. Still with me? Okay. Psalm 145, verse 9, tells us that God extends his mercy and grace and love, not just to the elect, but to everyone. John chapter 16, and we've referenced this a few times, specifically verses 8 through 11. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit comes into the world to con convict all mankind of sin. Not everyone responds to that conviction, but the Holy Spirit brings conviction to all people. 1 Timothy 2.4, it's God's will that all men would be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants all people to get born again. Not all of them will. Doesn't mean that God doesn't want that. So, I know there's a lot there. I know there's a lot to, to chew on. But, again, so important to lay a, a good foundation before we get into the remainder of, of 9, 10, and 11 because it just it's kind of rinse and repeat the entire way through. I'm going to throw out one more verse and, and I'll kind of use this to, to start wrapping things up here. In Psalm uh, 69 verse 28, if you flip there. Some of you who've been around for a while, this won't be a, a new thought for you. Others of you who haven't been here for too long, this, this might be shocking to you. And that's okay. If it encourages you or prompts you to go dig back into the Word. So Psalm 69, look at verse 28. Let me start in verse 27, but before I read this, this is written by David, a man after God's own heart. The majority of Psalm 69, David is talking about his enemies, literal enemies, I believe. I mean, David was constantly confronted with, with those who wanted to kill him and came against him. He says this in verse 27, charge them with crime upon crime and do not let them share in your salvation. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. Speaking of his enemies, may they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. Man after God's own heart. How can he be saying that? Blot his enemies, those who aren't lovers and followers of God like him. How can, how can David say... Blot them out of your, your book, out of the book of life. Is it possible that everyone born into this world, or I should say conceived, is it possible that everyone that's conceived is written in the book of life? And only by rejecting what God has made available to them are they blotted out of the book of life. Oh, I don't know, Pastor Drab. I've never heard that before. That's really crazy. Let me read from um, the commentary here in Psalm 69 from my favorite Bible teacher and uh, one that I've listened to for many years, John Corson. You guys, many of you have studied John's stuff. But he says this in Psalm 
uh, 69, the, the passages we just read. Because God desires that no one should perish, 2 Peter 3, 9, I believe every person's name is written in the book of life. But names can be blotted out. How? By saying, I don't want to be a part of your family, Lord. God loves us so much that he would say to people today, the only way you can be blotted out of the book of life, the only way you can end up in hell is over my dead body. I died to keep you from that place. But if you trample on that body, if you refuse to receive what was done in the breaking and bleeding of that body, you will experience wrath and righteous indignation because your sin will remain and it will be your sin that will keep you out of heaven. I know that's a radical thought for some of you, perhaps. I believe that for a lot of years. But it's not just an Old Testament idea, folks. If you read Revelation chapter 3, specifically the letter to the church in Sardis, the same phrase or the same language is used. I will not, speaking to the believers in Sardis, I will not blot your name out of the book of life. So, in the context of what we're studying here, big picture. Could it be that God's will for all mankind, 1, Peter 2, or 1 Timothy 2.4, could it be that God's will for all mankind is that they would all be saved? Without question, in my opinion. Could it be that every person that's conceived in this world has their name written in the book of life and only by rejecting the broken body of Jesus and his sacrifice are their names blotted out. Almost as if God's doing everything he possibly can for people to come to faith. You think God wants to make it hard for people to get born again and spend eternity with him in heaven? No way, man. If a little kid can understand it. We have this idea, many of you would, would um, adhere to this idea or believe this, that, that aborted babies or those that die when they're, when they're really young are going to be in heaven. Why do you believe that? Or why is that teaching out there? It, it, it's kind of resting on the foundation of the passage we just read in Psalms, right? The names are written in there, and only by rejecting what Jesus has done are the names blotted out. T. Sievert at Hotmail.com for those of you that are <laughs> angry and upset. RefugeMT at Gmail.com. You can send your hate emails there. <laughs> well, pastor, I don't buy it. I don't believe that God loves all mankind, only the elect. I don't believe that he wants all mankind to be saved, only the elect. I don't believe that he shows mercy to all mankind, only the elect. I don't believe that everyone's name is written in the book of life, only the elect. Okay. Great. Believe what you're going to believe. But here's the deal. If I'm going to err on either side of this argument, you better believe I'm going to err on the side that says that God is gracious and loving and merciful and wants all people to be born again. If I'm going to err on either side of this argument, that's where I'm going to land. You can land on the other side for whatever rhyme or reason you come up with as to the sovereignty of God, why he would create some for the fires of hell. You can believe that if you want. But if I'm going to err on any side, I'm going to err on this side. And I believe the scriptures are fully in support of that perspective. We serve a God, those of you who are believers, who loves people passionately. And he gave everything to prove that. So if you're going to come to me with doctrines that say otherwise, man... Get ready. Put your theological boxing gloves on because we're going to go rounds. I, I want to end with one passage in Matthew 25. And, and this, this is to, to emphasize this idea and based on what we're studying in the book of Romans. This is, looking at this passage is to emphasize this idea that what you believe about the nature and character of God is hugely important. And if you get it wrong, folks, if I get it wrong, if we misrepresent the nature and character of God with each other and with the world, it comes with big time consequences. There's nothing more important for us as believers 
in my opinion, that we have to hang on to than what we share with others about who God is and what he's like. That's as important as anything. And what we share with people about who God is and what he's like is hugely important. So Matthew 25, you guys all know this passage. You've probably read it and studied it numerous times. The parable of the talents. I'm going to start in verse 14, Matthew 25, verse 14. Let me just read this to you. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. And then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. And the man who had received the five talents brought another five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained you five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. How do you harvest where you haven't sown any seed? You ever pick up on what this servant is saying about his master? So I was afraid. I was afraid of you, master. So I went out and I hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents, for everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth." There's a whole lot there. We're not going to unpack all of it. I want to, cut, I want to touch on a couple things there. I want, to, I want to emphasize or focus on what the wicked servant said about his master. He said this, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. The word for hard is scleris in the, in the Greek language. And it means hard or harsh or severe. Now, who's the master representing in this parable? Jesus. Would any of you who are believers say, man, Jesus, you are so hard and severe? Hopefully not. The the guy who gave everything for you and, and suffered and died in your place, hopefully that's not your perspective of him. I don't believe it's a biblical perspective. But here's what's really interesting about this. The way that in the original language this story plays out, when the, the, uh, the servant said to his master, he, he, the word he uses for knew there, I knew that you're a hard man, is the word gnosko in the original language. It means this, to come to know by experience and observation. And it indicates a relation between the person knowing and the object that's being known. Okay. So in this case, the the person knowing is the wicked servant, and he's saying that he knows who's the object or what's the object of his knowing. The master, right? Y'all still with me? Okay. So in other words, the wicked servant is saying to the master, I know what you're like because of my experience with you. I have a relationship with you, and I know what you're like because of that relationship that we have. 
Now here's where it gets really interesting. The master, when he responds in verse 26, he uses a different Greek word for new. And to me, the whole passage comes to life when you understand this. He doesn't use the word gnosko for new in verse 26. He uses the word I do, E-I-D-O, which means to know by perception. So the wicked servant is saying to the master, I know what you're like because of my experience. The master disagrees by using another Greek word for new, and he's showing us that he disagrees. And the master's saying, you only perceive that you know what I'm like. You think you have a relationship with me, but you don't really know me by experience. Remember Matthew 7, when Jesus said, many will come to me on that day and would say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and do many miracles? And Jesus would say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. The master disagrees with the servant. It's interesting when you look at how the master speaks of the servant. At first he calls him wicked and lazy, but then he, at the end he, he, he leaves out the lazy. I think the emphasis there is on this wrong perception that the, the servant has of his master. Folks, this is hugely important. Let me ask you a question from this, this parable. Why would the master give any talents to the wicked, lazy servant? Did the master not know what he was like? Does Jesus not know what we're like? Why would he give a talent to him, knowing that he's, I know this guy, he's a bum. Is it possible that the master gave the talent to him to just demonstrate his his grace and his mercy and his willingness to give an opportunity for this person to bear fruit and to bring a reward or to bring a, uh, whatever you call it, return. There's the word I'm looking for. I mean, to me, that fits with the nature and the character of God that we've talked about all morning. He is giving opportunity. He's extending grace. He's offering life to everyone. But you can have a different perspective of him and say, nah, you're, you're a hard man. You're a jerk. You're not fair. What we believe about God, what we believe about his nature and his character, again, is one of the most important things that we have, folks. And many of us get it wrong. Not because we want to, but many of us have just been taught really bad things and we have jacked up perspectives and, and perceptions of who God is because of things that we've been taught that are, that are incorrect and they don't line up with the scriptures. Well, I don't believe you, Pastor Trevor. Well, go back and study it then and we can all just study the Bible. We can figure out what God has to say. I'm not saying I have it all figured out, but man, I'm going to share with you my thoughts and I'm going to encourage you to go back to the Word and to dig in and to find out what the Bible says about this God that we say that we love and want to serve. Folks, our God is rich in mercy. He's rich in grace. He's rich in love. He offers life, he offers salvation to all mankind. And if you or your theology or your doctrines that you believe don't line up with those things, then you have to go back to the scripture and dig in more. You have to. Because the God that we present to this world, the Savior that we put in front of people, we got to get that right. We're going to be jacked up and messed up. Many people say, I don't want to be a Christian because you Christians are all a bunch of idiots and you're a bunch of heathens and you're a bunch of, you know, whatever. Yep, we are. But he's not. He's perfect and he's loving and he's merciful. And he's given everything for every one of us. So let's not give him a bad name. Amen? Amen. If you're here this morning and you haven't responded to the love of God, if you haven't had your sins dealt with and forgiven, if you haven't said, Jesus, I need a Savior, <laughs> you came to save mankind, and I haven't given you my sin, and the Bible says, and I, you might not know what the Bible says, but I'm going to tell you, the Bible says that we are all sinful and broken 
we are all destined for an eternity in hell, separated from God because of our sin and rebellion. The only hope that the Bible gives us, the only hope that we have is in Jesus, folks, putting your confidence in him. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to the Father but through me. Well, but what about the Buddhist eightfold path? And what about the Muslims? And what about this? And what about that? Whatever, we have a Savior who died and rose again. If you know any other people that have died and rose again to take your sins away, come talk to me. Well, don't, because there isn't. <laughs> I don't want to hear about him because it's not true. But, folks, what more proof do we need? History records it. It's, it's fact. It happened. And try as the skeptics may over the years, and lots and lots of people have tried, nobody's ever been able to disprove it because it happened. So that's how I can say Jesus is the only way. There's no other way, folks. Your life is going to be required of you at some point. And you don't know when. You don't know when you're going to take your last breath. If you haven't made it right with the Savior, if you haven't said, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin and my rebellion. I deserve hell and separation from, from you, but because of your love, I don't have to experience that. I trust in you. I trust in what you've done. Folks, it's so simple. I'm pleading with you. I'll be a salesman right now. Folks, there's no better news that you're ever going to hear. And you will thank me for all of eternity. Well, you won't thank me. You'll thank him. But thanks for telling me, Trav. Man, it's the greatest news you're ever going to hear. And it's free. It costs you nothing. It's not about rules and regulations. It's not about religion. It's about the love of God for mankind. Just grab onto it. Grab onto it today. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thanks for, for being a God of such incredible love and grace and mercy. Lord, that you are rich in all of those things is such a blessing because I am, I'm such a poor pauper, Lord so wicked and so rebellious and so bent on doing my own thing over and over and over again. Lord, if I didn't have your grace and your mercy and forgiveness, I would be in a world of hurt. And so would all of us. So Lord, as we, as we stare down the new year, as we consider, Lord, that, that this new year comes with all kinds of things, good works that you've planned and purposed in advance for us to walk in. We have no clue what those things are. But Lord, you have, you have purposed those things from before the beginning of time. You have gifted us, you have called us, you have chosen us, Lord, to be your servants in this world, your ambassadors, Lord, and you've filled us with your spirit and given us the spiritual gifts that we need to be able to step in and to accomplish everything that you've purposed for us, Lord, as we just allow you to work in and through us. So, Lord, may this year be a year that we can look back on at the end of 2024 and say, Lord, that was a year that I allowed you to be at work in my life. That was a year that I was serious, Lord, about looking to you and about just pleading, Lord, for your empowerment, the outpouring of your spirit on my life. Lord, you promised that in the last days you'll pour out your spirit, and God, I need it. So, Lord, may this be a year that's marked by us being filled and empowered by your spirit. And, Lord, may this be a year of us just going back to your word over and over and over again and learning more and more about who you are and what you're like. Lord, that we might be able to pass that incredibly good news on to the world around us. Lord, I'm so grateful that you love people. I'm so grateful that you love broken sinners like me, Lord. And I'm so grateful, God, that for the hope that we have beyond this world. So Lord, bless your people. Fill them, Lord, with your spirit. Use them for the good purposes, the good, the good works that you've prepared in advance. Lord, may, may we make you proud this year, Lord. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.